Welcome to the Archetypal Mosaic. This is Mikhail Tank. Today's show is supernatural and extra special. We have two guests on one call, Dacre Stoker and J.D. Barker, with the prequel to the world-famous classic Dracula called Dracul. Welcome. Please let's start with both of your min mini bios. Uh, each of you, please tell the audience how you started writing and how both of you found each other and decided to work on this project. Do you want me to go first, JD? Yeah, go ahead. You, you fact check me at the end, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, obviously I'm lucky enough to be born into an, an interesting surname. Bram Stoker was my great grand uncle, so his youngest brother is my great grandfather. Uh, I was not always into this uh, genre of writing and horror. I was more of a, of a sportsman having grown up in Canada before moving to the southern U.S. Um, participated in the sport of modern pentathlon, uh, both as a coach and athlete at the Olympic level. And an opportunity came along, uh, sort of in between careers of a teacher, uh, that I got into researching Bram to uh, write a sequel to Dracula back in, published in 2009. And that just threw me, you know, full two feet into who was my family, you know, that sort of that, that roots trip that we all take. But I had a lot of, a lot of material to dig up. Because, um, you know, a lot of people know Dracula, but not a lot of people know Bram Stoker. And that's what sort of got me going. And I was lucky enough to find uh, some privileged papers that the family had, a journal of brands, and sort of that got me on, on the road to tell the story that um, that, that we tell with, with J.D. Barker. And meeting J.D. was it was an amazing uh, opportunity for me that didn't present itself you know, right from the beginning uh, when this project started. It was been in my brain for a while, but I knew I had to find somebody uh, that could write this with me because I'm just not, not a strong enough fictional writer. And uh, I read a book called Forsaken that was on the uh, list of the Horror Writers Association, the book J.D. and I are members of, uh, of, of Best First Novel. And I was asked to, to give out that prize that year. And I figured, well, I better do my homework. And I read Forsaken. And it just resonated then and there that this, this was the guy that I needed to meet and I needed to convince him to, to write with me. Because the story, without giving away spoilers, had some really interesting elements of it that um, you know, I felt needed to you know, sort of hit home with me and needed to come out in Dracul. So off to the Horror Writers Association meeting, I go in Atlanta and I get my courage up to, to meet JD and he'll, he'll tell you sort of how we, how we actually physically came together, which is kind of a cool story. And um, you know, ended up pitching him the idea. And as I say, the rest is history. It's been an incredible collaboration and, uh, and a real joy and we're really happy with the product. Great. And I've, I've been um, working in the, the written work for geez, a really long time. I worked as a, a book doctor and a ghostwriter for about 20 some years. Um, I, I ended up with six different books that hit the New York Times bestseller list with other people's names on them. Um, the last one was uh, 2012, and that was kind of the, you know, for, for, I'll throw the first pun out there, the, the first nail in the coffin or the last nail in the coffin. Um, and I decided to go out and, and write my, a novel on my own, which turned out to be Forsaken. Um, and I, I got crazy lucky. Stephen King read a, an advanced copy of it and allowed me to use some of his characters from Needful Things in it. And that, that really helped launch the book. Um, and like Dacre said, it was up for the, the Bram Stoker Award for Best Debut Novel. Um, since then, I've written a, a serial killer series based out of Chicago. Our uh, first book is called The Fourth Monkey, and the second one is called The Fifth to Die. Um, both of those are in production at uh, CBS for um, film and television. Um, and then yeah, Dacre uh, reached out to me, um, and we were you know, we were basically both in Atlanta for the, the Horror Writers Convention, and you know, I was there because the novel had been nominated. Um, and you know, we, we ended up meeting at a, a signing for the first time, and you know, I had no idea that that was actually an audition. Um, but we ended up sitting next to each other for about an hour and a half, and we just talked for a while. Um, you know, I had a living, breathing stroke, stoker next to me, so I was obviously going to pick his brain on everything Dracula-related. And um, he, you know, we started talking about some of the stuff that I'd written in the past, and I had a, a short story that I had wrote about uh, Bram Stoker, who was a theater manager. And um, I wrote how, you know, one night he left the Lyceum Theater, and he got confronted by Dracula in, the, in an alley behind the theater, and Dracula said, well, if you want to live, you have to entertain me with a story. Um, so Bram did. Um, so we, you know, Dacre and I talked for a little bit, and then we kind of went our separate ways. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of you know, didn't realize that that you know what was really going on there. And um, you know, throughout the rest of the conference, Dacre kept trying to flag me down and you know, saying we need to talk, we need to talk. 
uh, but it was a little, a little crazy and kind of busy. Um, so we made plans to have breakfast the following morning, and during the middle of breakfast, he, he springs this on me. You know, the family's been looking for somebody to write a prequel to Dracula for a while now, uh, using Bram's original notes. Is that something you'd be interested in doing? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I said yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to turn down a project like that. It was just such a fascinating idea to be able to have access to that material. It's you know once in a lifetime thing. Wow, we have something in common. Was I did three official Dollar Babies with Stephen King, so he's an amazing person to collaborate with. Amazing. Yeah, I got lucky. I, I just purchased a, a copy of this, the original typescript of Needful Things. Mm. Um, I actually bought it yesterday in a charity auction, so I'm really excited about that. Gorgeous. Now, uh, he's, a, he's a hero of mine. That Salem's Lot was, was my first vampire story that I read. And uh, I, mean, I, I had been a, a Stephen King fan, but when, when I read Salem's Lot, it was like, this, this, is, this is really cool. When I found out that he actually said, something to the effect of that Bram Stoker was to bring Dracula to America, it would be like say Slot coming into a, a small, sleepy little town in Maine. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been a disciple ever since. Beautiful. Um, I have so many questions. Uh, one of them being um, the estate of Bram Stoker. What's the estate like? Is there a museum? Uh, the notes and the notebooks that you feature or have utilized in the, the writing of this book, um, how did you find them? Are they under lock and key, etc.? And also, um, which of the current day uh, vampire movies and stories are appreciated by the Stokers and the Barkers? Whoa, okay. Um, let me start with trying to explain the Bram Stoker estate. There are two direct descendants of Bram still alive, his great-grandsons. Um, they're my cousins, obviously. And uh, they live in England and are very, you know, they're aware of the legacy of their great-grandfather, but they don't sort of embrace it as much as I do. They, they do help me uh, by providing me really cool stories. They were actually both brought up by the grandfather, Bram's son, because their, their father had died in, in the war. So they were actually, you know, interesting, you know, sort of raised by the closer link to Bram because their, their dad passed away early. Uh, and so they had some pretty neat stories of how Bram raised uh, his son, Noel. Uh, it, they don't make a big deal about it, which is kind of cool, but you know, horror fans think, oh, that's crazy. You know, this is, this is the, you know, the godfather, Bram Stoker, and the godmother of uh, Mary Shelley of, of Gothic Horror. You know, why do you guys you know, celebrate every day, you know, every night? <laughs> but, you know, they just get off their lives. They're charter accounts. But they did have some really cool things in their possession um, that I hunted down uh, rather nonchalantly. One of them showed me a box of things that they, they got from their grandfather, which had a journal of Bram, so it wasn't actually under lock and key, it was up in the attic. Mm -hmm. um, but trust me, it's now under lock and key, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Elizabeth Miller and I uh, published it called The Lost Journal of Bram Stoker in 2012, and it's now, you know, been really highly valued, so they've got to take really good care of it, it's, it's been a safe. The Bram Stoker notes, there's, there's really some really cool stories they come about how these different called source materials have sort of moved around the world. And, and you've got to realize, you know, at the time, Dracula was, was pretty popular, but it was nothing like it is now. And the Dracula notes were sold not long after Bram died by his widow, along with some of his other books. And I've been able to hunt down sort of the, the sale, the, the, the auction sale, where these things went. But they sort of got lost. The provenance has sort of been lost. But they did end up, luckily, nobody knows exactly how, in the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. Mm. Um, and so that 125 pages of Bram's notes where you can see all his characterization and his cool research and the dialects and all these other cool things that he that he thought of and took from his other books along with the list of the resources are all right there. Um, so the estate doesn't own those anymore. They own the intellectual property of them. Hmm. Uh, but they don't own those actual notes. And then the other cool thing that J.D. had it down, and J.D. actually can get the credit for making the, making the email to Paul Allen's uh, estate is, is in Vulcan Industries, who actually own the Dracula typescript. Hmm. The typescript is the manuscript that's been typed. And, and the cool thing about that is that we needed to, to see that firsthand because any authors worth their salt who are writing a prequel need to dovetail that story to the original beginning of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And we had heard over 
the years uh, from researchers and scholars that the TypeScript starts at page 102. So that means there's 101 pages missing, hmm. edited out for whatever reason. So we needed to get there and, and see, are there any clues in what's left in the manuscript? And we did, we found some that you know point directly towards a short story called Dracula's Guest, where we end our story <laughs> in a similar location using some of those characters in that same area, because when we analyzed TypeScript, we could see that Ram crossed out at least three things that were typewritten that referred to things in the 17 page short story that was taken out. Luckily it was published a few years later after Ram died by his widow. So it's kind of like this, this you know, treasure hunt that JD and I were on to different museums, different places to bring all this information together to sort of set the stage so we could tell the, tell the story of the prequel. Yeah, the, the manuscript in Seattle, that, that was really key to a lot of this. And for, first of all, when I heard that a, you know, nobody from the Stoker family had actually seen the original manuscript, um, I, I knew I had to make that happen somehow, um, which is why I reached out to Paul Allen and his foundation, and, and luckily they were, you know, they were kind enough to allow us to go out there. And we, we spent a good number of hours locked in their conference room um, with you know, Paul Allen's people hovering over us as we flipped through these pages. Uh, but it, it allowed us to confirm a lot of the, the information that we had found through other sources. And, and just verify that you know that we were on the right track because we were really shooting to recreate those missing hundreds of pages. And I think most people don't realize that those pages are missing. And we all know the Dracula story, um, but you know I imagine just like you know in my world, like I always assume Dracula starts you know with Jonathan Harker on that train, um, but that's really on page 102. It's uh, you know 100 pages into the novel. There's, there's so much that happened before that. And in searching through everything that Dacre has found over the years, we were pretty sure we had pieced together the, the events that, that were there before. Um, but actually seeing that manuscript and being able to comb through it and find references to those first missing 100 pages, um, that's where we were really able to confirm what we had was, you know, we were on the right the right track. Um, and, and that was a fascinating document to look at. I mean, just to see the, you know, the typewritten manuscript, but also with Bram's notes in the margins, um, notes from his editor in there, notes from his brother, uh, Thornley Wayne, in on the medical jargon and, and, and that aspect of it. Um, I mean, that was a, a priceless experience for sure. Now, how long... That, that typescript was actually found uh, in a barn in Pennsylvania that uh, many believe was, was owned by this guy who was a, a lawyer and a close friend of Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman and Bram Stoker were good friends, as was Bram with his lawyer. So people believe it's quite possible that Bram had bring, brung it and given it to either Whitman or Donaldson, and generations later it shows up in a trunk in a barn when the family is finally selling the place. And then luckily, someone like Paul Allen uh, purchases it at auction because he's obviously preserved the thing beautifully and allows guys like me and JD to look at it. And they also display some of the pages on a rotating basis at the Museum of Popular Culture in Seattle. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a neat thing. It's one of the cornerstones, you know, of, of the Dracula lore that uh, we all talk about and sort of desire to have an audience with. Now, does the Stoker state or or uh, Mr. Barker, aside from, of course, uh, the classic and your incredible writings, are there any other uh, vampire-based uh, things in common day culture that are kind of appreciated by either of you? Do, do you, Are you fans of any other vampire uh, trilogies or anything like that? We, we were just joking around about this. So vampires don't sparkle. Um, exactly. and, and it, if you go through Bram's original notes, he's actually got a page in his notes where he wrote down you know, his, his rules on vampires, you know, what they could do and what they couldn't do. Um, and you know, th that being one of them. Um, now in Bram's world, the vampires can walk around in daylight. They're just, they're more or less human. So they're in a weakened state and they try to avoid it. Um, but they, they can go outside. Uh, I, I believe the whole, you know, sunlight destroying them thing came around with Nosferatu when that film was made. Um, I, I really think Francis Ford Coppola kind of nailed the, the, you know, the, the feel of the, the original novel, even though he changed the, the story itself around. Um, that, that's one of my favorite films for sure. Um, and yeah, Anne Rice, you know, an Interview with the Vampires is probably one of my all-time favorite books. Those first three in particular in the series, um, I've read those you know, more times than I can count. Right. 
Um, how long did the process of Dracul take in terms of from conception to finalization? And also the percentage of the original notes that you've discussed and uh, the fictional element that you've added to complete the book? Tell me the- yeah, you better realize, Nick, Nick, uh, let me just say one more quick thing here. You, you know, vampires back in when Bram wrote the story um, in, in 1890, uh, you, you know, Bram didn't invent them. Um, there was legitimate concerns in throughout all of, all of Europe and, and big part of the world that vampires were a real thing to be concerned about. They're the folklores and superstitions. Um, as J.D. mentioned in an interview, He mentioned about 13 different countries that, that, that he was aware of that had these superstitions and folklore that, that were all about the souls of, of, that, that aren't at rest that come out and take, take the life from the living. So it was something that people were quite aware of. I wouldn't say they, you know, the whole world believed in them, but they were very aware of it. And some obviously did believe because they would have these rituals that take up the bodies out of the grave and cut out the hearts and burn them crossroads in some cases put the ashes and make a potion and the, and the victims who were having their blood sucked drink, and drink it as a tea they were decapitating putting in garlic so all these things that were in people's awareness and consciousness Bram used in the story and placed everything 
original preface to Dracula before it was edited made the story sound like it was very, very real. And that's the premise we based this thing on. Great answers. Um, now, I have a two-part question here. The ladies' names, and the, of course, in the original we have Mina. Here we have Ellen, we have Matilda. Uh, was Matilda the real name of the sister? Yes, and, absolutely. And what about Ellen? She was not the real name of the nanny. Okay, so... Um, we, we did everything we could. Because let me say, well, everything we could, wherever we could, mm -hmm. To use an accurate timeline with ages and dates. Of course, we had to fudge a couple of things, um, but you know, a, a good majority of where the Stokers lived, who these people were, who they're married to, where they worked, where they graduated from, all these things, just like Bram did in his story, were based on reality and as close to real time as we could get them. So it would resonate. <laughs> Holy geez, this is real stuff. Okay, great. Yeah, actually, in, in the original preface, to, um, which was changed, you know, Bram says that the, the characters in, that, in the story are real, and they're based on real people, and a, and a few of the names have been changed. And as, as you read that, you know, I, I almost got like a Wizard of Oz, uh, Wizard of Oz kind of vibe you know, at the end, where you realize who everybody is. You know, Bram is really Jonathan Harker, Matilda in a way is Mina, um, Banbury is, is Van Helsing. Yeah, the Dr. Stewart is, is his brother Thornley. I mean, he, he based yeah. the characters on, on the people that he was actually surrounded with in real life and, and the ones that, you know, were part of his, his story. Now, is there any plan to release the classic Dracula with all the additions that have been omitted? Yeah, so they've been done in a way, um, probably not like everything at one time, but they, it has been done. Like some people have put out... Um, annotated versions that have some of these things in there and these, these books become because they're $65 <laughs> massive books um, so I don't know um, it's, it's a very good question because it would be hard to weave them together but some somebody did take the, the Dracula notes and, and take little bits of it and said well what would happen if it wasn't edited um, so I don't think they've done it very well mm -hmm. I mean certainly not like JD and I would do if we were to embark on it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thought because it is sort of creating a, a, a logical hole uh, if somebody's up for the task. A lot of the information is still getting discovered. And one of the things that, that you know, Dacre kind of ran into, like in today's world, I, I write a book and I, I send my, you know, the copy goes off to my editor at one publishing house. And from there, they farm it out to all the other publishers around the world and they do their translations and then they put it out in the various markets. But in Bram's day, those, those additional copies actually left from his desk. So even though they made significant edits on the UK version, he was able to leave a lot of the material that he wanted from the original novel in his, his other releases around the world. Um, he, he kept those parts in. And what Dacre has found is that, you know, like in the Icelandic case in particular, if you translate the original first edition, you, know, you find some of this, this text, the parts that Bram basically hid away that you know, were stripped away from the, the most common version of the book. And it's tricky with Dracula because with it being public domain, you know, even today, a lot of you know companies or people that go out there to release a version of Dracula, you know, whether it's in English or another another language, they go to you know the internet and they pull like the Gutenberg version down, and you know they just translate it from that. So they're all working off a current version of Dracula. They're not working off the original version. But you know, like I said, if, if you go back to those first editions and you translate them to English, Bram was able to hide a lot of those things that he wanted to keep in the story that his, his UK publisher you know, tried to omit. Very interesting. Now let's talk about the archetypal value. Um, I'm sure that probably both of you have held the first edition. And also I want to talk to you about talismans uh, from the estate. Um, uh, Dacre, for example, do you have or have you held anything from Abraham Stoker, which is related to Dracula, which, for example, gives you that feeling, that incredible feeling, that flush of energy that... Um, you know, makes you go back in time or really inspires you to write or come up with ideas. And how do both of you feel when you hold the the original first editions? I, I've got to say, I mean, I'm going to tell you a couple of really cool things. Mm -hmm. um, I own a first edition myself that was sitting on a shelf growing up in Montreal, Canada that was, that was inscribed uh, from Bram to his mother. Ooh. And then passed on from his mother to a brother, Richard, who moved to British Columbia. That's got the name of the town he lived. And then, but 
he died, he passed it to his wife, who is, his name is now on the inside that cover as well, and it was passed on to my dad. So I've got a, I've got a book with, you know, some pretty cool history in, in that front page. Amazing. But um, recently, my cousins, the two great-grandsons of Brams, I helped to pull things out of their archives and bring them to America in, in an effort to have them in a museum exhibit. Unfortunately, that w- that wasn't possible. Um, not, not because I didn't have all the cool stuff, but it just, you know, funding wasn't there. And it, was, it was a big deal. But I am bringing those to Finland, um, funnily enough, uh, in February, because they're putting on an exhibit. And I brought some of them to Taiwan and some to Milan, Italy. I really want to get one in America sometime. We've got some really cool stuff. And I won't tell you all of the pieces, but the one piece that had that effect on me um, Kyle, it was, it, it, it made me almost, you know, get that goosebump feeling. Mm-hmm. And, it, and partly because I held in my hand are two original letters. And I feel this way now, as I say it, even though they're back in England. Two original letters that Bram's mother wrote to him. Mm-hmm. And the first one, she was in good health. And she said, congratulations on the success of Dracula. You should, you should do very well with this. Um, you know, nobody since... Um, Shelley's Frankenstein to be, you know, has, has had any kind of impact like this, you know, feel very proud of you. The next one was sort of six or eight months later and we knew that her health was failing and her vision was begin- beginning to go. And my gosh, it was so sad because she said, I'm, I'm writing you this letter, I've just read a review, it was hard to see in the newspaper, I've read a review of your book, I'm, I'm so proud of you, I hope this will make you lots of money. Um, and I hope this gets to you, and I don't become a burden, a burden to you before I'm gone. Mm. And that the good Lord takes me while I still have some sight. I mean, I, I, I was tearing mm. as I was reading this, and I realized that I'm sitting here at my desk with this letter that she wrote, two letters, and the very same book mm. that Bram inscribed and gave to her that she read that caused her to write this letter. Wow. Amazing. And I, and I had one of those, like J.D. said, Wizard of Oz kind of aha moments. Like, oh my gosh, this, this goes back to the blood and the soul, the DNA of this incredible family, where it all started. Oh, amazing. What about you, Mr. Barker? I, I've got a ton of um, rare books and, and manuscripts that I've collected over the years, but I have yet to pick up a, a first edition, an edition of Dracula. I've got my eye out, but I haven't gotten one yet. Okay. Well, that, fantastic answers on that. I definitely felt the goosebumps myself. Um, let's talk about the cover art and the film option, or as much as we can. Uh, the cover art is pretty interesting. We have a beautiful neck ready to be bit. Can you tell me how <laughs> how was that chosen? Uh, you know, what's the, the the choice behind the cover? It's a Putnam book, and it's also optioned currently by Paramount. Can you talk to to me about those three things? JD, why don't you go first since I led the way on this last one? The, the cover we we literally have zero control over. Um, it was it was shown to us, and and you know, obviously we loved it. Um, but yeah, when you're dealing with somebody as large as Putnam, they, you know, they've got people that are you know way above our pay grade that that come up with that design, and it's you know they did a, a great job. Um, and there, you know, there's some elements to it that I'll let Dager touch on that, that are really cool. Um, and yeah, Paramount scooped up the film rights. Um, that we, we had a, a crazy time when this, this book was coming out. We basically we both went up to New York, um, and we we ran you know through every uh, you know big publisher that was up there, just meeting after meeting after meeting. And in between those, we were on the phone with the film and television producers um, talking about the book. And Paramount ended up picking up the the film rights with Andy Machete attached to direct, um, to his best known for. for doing it for Stephen King on the, the remake. Um, he also has a fantastic movie out there called Mama. Um, so he's a, a great guy for, for this project. Um, so that, that that's going on. And, and you know, that, that type of thing takes time, but it, it seems like there's there's some pretty good movement there and it looks like it's happening pretty quick. Um, Digger, you want to touch on the, the cover, on the hard cover? Yeah, I, I will. Um, you know, I, I didn't know this back in, back in its day because I have had my eye on other first editions of Dracula and apparently, uh, for your listeners that your book jackets back in the Victorian era uh, were called dust covers um, because obviously there was so much coal and soot that was you know in the atmosphere uh, heating everything and so there was so much of the soot around that the, the, the dust covers were just that uh, to protect the book so when you went in to buy a book and you put it to the shelf to, to the seller you would take it off the shelf take off the, the dust jacket which is dirty throw it in the trash and hand you your 
your book. So if there's any people out there that are uh, buyers of books and can find ones with dust jackets uh, still on, they're very valuable. Uh, when you, if, if you, your listeners do buy this wonderful hardcover book and glimpse behind the dust jacket, so take off the dust jacket of Dracul, and we've got something very special that Putt agreed to put on the spine, and that was some original artwork of Matilda Stoker, mm. Bram's sister. As, as we depict her as an artist in the story, she is a real artist. And so we had found some of these uh, pictures of hers, drawings, and we got them digitized. And it's so cool to see, to look closely. This is all by hand. There was no, you know, no machines or anything working. But the coolest part of this particular design that we chose was that it's snakes. And of course we feature, and I won't spoil it for your people, snakes somewhere in Dracul, but also there's obviously the legend of uh, Ireland and St. George chasing the snakes uh, out of Ireland. So it, there's, there's sort of lots of double meanings, but it's a p- kind of cool reveal uh, behind the dust jacket that Matilda, the artist, is, is hiding there, a little treat for everybody. Beautifully said. Yes, audience, please check it, get the book. Um, as we begin to wrap up the interview, we have a few minutes left. I have a few more questions. The first one is about Transylvania itself. Now, I've traveled and stayed at a council state, and also I've been a member of the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Miller's um, found program before she retired. So I want to ask you about your collaboration with Elizabeth Miller. Um, also, some, some of your favorite spots of Transylvania. How much of uh, drag the character was based on Vlad the Impaler and your upcoming or to be released travel book with special parts from both books right is that coming up too yes uh, y- yes and maybe um, I'm very close with Elizabeth Miller we collaborated on the Lost Journal together which was a wonderful year and a half long event we also talk uh, about every month she is my mentor um, she's the Dracula police. She is great. Um, we have traveled to Ireland together. Uh, I have picking up the mantle. She's introduced me to people in Transylvania, and I now lead trips over there. Um, and I've done probably eight or ten of them now. Um, and I love going to see Brand Castle. Um, but I will just tell you briefly that it's not Dracula's castle, even though uh, I have chosen to say that once when Airbnb hired me to do Night at, night at Dracula's Castle a couple of Halloweens ago. But the coolest thing is, besides the castles are great, the Romanian people are great, the roads aren't so great, uh, but I did get to climb this summer with my son, and this is a bit of a nod to the very end of Dracul that JD and I dug around the notes, and we found the actual lines of longitude and latitude that uh, in his notes in the Rosenberg Museum, as well as references to rivers and towns where Bram placed his fictional castle Dracula, which is up in the northern part of the country in the Borgo Pass. And as, as you know, uh, because if you're a member of the Transylvania Society of Dracula, you know the Bram Castle is about 400 miles south of that. So where is Dracula's castle? Well, J.D. and I nailed it using Bram's own sort of ciphering way of putting these lines of longitude on the top of Mount Isabel in the Columbana Louis National Park. It's an extinct volcano, and it was a, a place that Bram, uh, I am con- you know, convinced that this was his fictional castle, because part of the cool things that we also found in the Dracula type script was that the original ending before being edited out with the other 101 pages was a volcanic eruption at the end of the story that was removed. And only Bram Stoker would have gone so far as to make sure if he was going to have a volcanic eruption that the mountain he placed his castle on would have been a volcano. And it, will that be coming out, the, the map or the tour book? Uh, or what uh, you the found? tour book, I'm sorry. Yeah, you did ask that. Um, I sort of delayed that because I keep going back and finding more things, mm-hmm. <laughs> more things to to explain. And it was, you know, it is recently this June. And since we were up on this mountaintop, we found some really cool trails. It, it was about a seven, it felt like Gilligan's Island. It took us far too long. And, and once we were up there, we found a much easier trail, excuse me, once we came back, an easier trail uh, to get to it and come back. So I'm thinking that's going to be delayed probably another year to get this travel guide just right. But I do want to bring people 
to see the places where Bram Stoker set his story, where we set Dracul, but also the real Vlad Dracula. Um, he does play a small role, obviously, in the, the Dracula uh, genre. Uh, Bram Stoker knew a little bit about him uh, from a book in the Whitney Library by William Wilkinson and also another book by James Samuelson that described uh, Vlad as a fierce warrior, that he impaled people. Um, and of course, his name, you know, just resonated to Bram, you know, Dracula. Uh, he had originally was going to call his, his vampire Wampir. So lucky that was in the Whitby Library and he found it. Um, but he really, you know, the real Vlad uh, was not a, a blood sucking vampire. He was a bloodthirsty ruler. Um, and, and the Romanians loved him because he did protect them from the invading Ottomans for about seven years. So he's a bit of a hero, and they kind of laugh at some of us that go there going, you know, hey man, we're the vampires. Uh, they still believe in some parts of that country that they're vampires, but Vlad was not one of them. You know, it's interesting, looking from a distance in, in the imagination, uh, when you see people impaled, a large amount of people impaled on sticks with blood running down, it may very well look like teeth or a bloody mouth. Yeah, because those, those sticks went all the way up to <laughs> their lower region of yeah, their mouth. Exactly. <laughs> with, with that one stake sticking out of that blood. It was, apparently it was a pretty gruesome way to go. JD and I have talked about it. We, we're not really great fans to raise our hand to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. And then finally, um, any Dracula conventions, projects, limited signed editions of the book, and what would you like to tell the fans? Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of conventions coming up. I, I've actually got my appearances listed on my website, so that's the best place to, to go to, to find that. Um, signed editions are going to be tricky to come by just because Dacre and I live in different parts of the country. Um, it, it, the simplest way to get one if somebody's trying to get something autographed by both of us is to contact the Mysterious Bookshop in New York. Mm. Uh, it's one of the few places where we're both going to be and we're both going to be able to sign and they're taking pre-orders so they'll, they'll put the book aside for you and, you know, with a little note saying make this up to so-and-so. Um, so if somebody's looking for, for that, that's probably the simplest way to do it. Um, otherwise, we're, we're both bouncing around. We've got a number of appearances together. We've got a number of appearances separate. Uh, we're both heading overseas uh, to the UK for a little bit um, towards the second half of October and then coming back again. Um, so the websites are definitely the, the best place to, to you know, get caught up on that and just try to find some place nearby if you're, you're trying to do that. Yeah, follow us on Facebook. I know we both have our own pages. And, um, you know, we, we try to keep people uh, up to date with, with the action, both on our personal websites and also on Facebook. One cool thing JD and I are doing uh, is we're actually going to Dublin, Ireland to lead a group of Spanish, French, and Irish journalists around Dublin to the places where the action at Dracul happens. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that for a number of reasons, you know, to, to enlighten these journalists about, you know, where the story took place, but also to kind of just get in there in that sort of, the, you know, the cold, misty, you know, sort of fogginess of, of Dublin and getting the atmosphere as, as the book comes out. So I'm really looking forward to that. Wonderful. Is there anything you'd like to tell the fans? And a bonus little question. Why did he call himself Bram instead of the full name Abraham? Uh, that's a great question. A lot of people uh, you know, wonder about that. His, his father was called Abraham. He was obviously named after his dad. And he had a bit of a tense relationship with his father because Bram was the only one who uh, sort of moved away from the civil servant or the other brothers were doctors. And Bram went to sort of this life that was not looked at by his dad as being the most upstanding thing to do, which was the life of a theater manager and a writer. And, and so for the years that his his dad lived and worked in Dublin alongside the rest of the family, he kept the name Abraham. But when his father moved with his with his wife and the two daughters to uh, to Europe, to Switzerland and, and Italy, to sort of where their pension went a little bit further, Bram shortened his name to, to Bram. And we've never seen anything in writing. He's never come out and said, you know, I need to be liberated from my you know heavy-handed father. But I think there's a little bit of that there. Uh, it's just Bram uh, exercising his individuality and said, you know, here I am, you know, take me as I am, I'm Bram. Mm, that's well said, that's like a poem right there. Um, fantastic, is there anything else either of you would like to add before we complete? Well, thank you, ben, so, uh, thank you great, so much. Yeah, fantastic. Just, you know, keep, keep your eye out for us, and uh, you know, you never know when, when we might want to continue our story because there is a, it's about seven 
years between when Draco ends and, and, and Draco actually starts. And keep your eye out for hopefully Andy Machete does a great job with the uh, the Paramount film. Um, so there we go. Thank you so much. We've been talking to Dacre Stoker and J.D. Barker and the upcoming novel Dracul, available at Putnam, uh, at Amazon, and all of your book publishers near you. So please go get the book. Thanks so much for being on the Archetypal Mosaic. Thank you.